Okay, we're going to get started. Good morning. Welcome to day two of the Stream Media East show. My name is Dan Rayburn. I'm the conference chairman. I'm going to make a couple quick announcements. We're going to jump right into our keynote. Uh, we have still a lot of sessions today, even though it's day two of the show. We have things on uh, Twitter, live streaming. We've got a session on Dash, uh, Ultra HD. Uh, we have the keynote this morning about VR, but we also have another VR uh, session at the end of the day as well. Uh, so there's still a lot to see. If you can't catch everything at the show, we've archived, we will be archiving everything over the next two weeks at streamingmedia.com slash videos. So we're recording every single session uh, over the last three days, the CDN Summit, Streaming East Day 1 and Day 2 from all the track sessions, so you can catch all of those online. For the Q&A, for the keynote today, we're going to have uh, Jose running around with the mic, so just like yesterday, if you weren't here, just raise your hand, ask a question, we'll come over to you with the mic. Uh, my job here at the last day of the show is still try and get as many people together in terms of meeting each other and connecting each other, so I play matchmaker at the show for all three days. So if there's somebody you're trying to meet, if there's somebody you'd like to know, I got a couple uh, emails and text messages yesterday from organizations where, for instance, if you're an enterprise user and using video inside the firewall and you'd like to you meet more enterprise users that are here, that are maybe from your industry, feel free to send me an email or give me a call. I'll happy, be happy to introduce you to people so I can look up where people are and try and contact them for you. Uh, we're also going to be working uh, next year for the show on making it easier for everyone to connect with one another instead of trying to go through one single person. So uh, we are right now looking at ways we can do better uh, networking amongst people who come to the show so you can reach out to each other directly. Josh Courtney is the CEO and executive producer at Sky VR. Uh, so VR is something that we're hearing a lot about in the industry. It's, it's up for debate right now. Josh will probably argue with me on that, but it's up for debate right now on the impact it's going to have over the next couple of years, specifically on the streaming media industry. It definitely is new. Uh, we still have a ways to go. Uh, next year at the Device Pavilion, if you haven't seen it, the Device Pavilion on the exhibit floor where we have all the TVs and OTT devices you can try out. Josh and his crew are nicely next year going to provide us with some headsets. We're actually going to have a VR section of the pavilion next year so you can actually try out VR, which is nice. That's also going to show that more VR is coming with more content and more things that you can actually see on it. Uh, so VR is hot. Uh, we're going to do more VR next year as well. We're getting a lot more questions about it. So that's why I asked Josh to come and do the keynote this morning. Josh will talk a little bit about some of the companies he's produced VR for, but they have a lot of experience producing VR for sports as well as for other corporate clients as well, some military clients. So he's going to talk about how VR is being used across a lot of different sectors and a lot of different industries. So with that, please join me in welcoming Josh Courtney. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. Uh, well, I'm, like Dan said, I'm Josh Courtney from uh, SkyVR, and we are uh, kind of quickly becoming uh, one of the larger VR players in the market uh, today. Uh, a little bit of background uh, on me. We, my background is in production and in uh, live television production and feature film and commercial production uh, over the last 20 years. And uh, in one of our other companies, uh, we actually had our research and development division that uh, was doing a lot of cinema tech, a lot of tech in uh, integrations work inside of television. And uh, that slowly or quickly, depending on how you look at it, uh, started to move its way into the virtual reality market. Having been an entrepreneur for 20 years, uh, we've spent a lot of money over uh, a lot of years uh, too early in markets. And so we felt like it was important for us to stick around and actually wait for VR to mature a little bit and to start seeing a path for monetization. Uh, we felt like that was going to be this year. So last year, uh, we decided that it was time to actually make everything official and, and actually put a VR company out on the, on the market and, and start talking about what we're actually doing in that space on the R&D side, as well as moving into, uh, you know, what we're, what we're doing on the commercial side. So, um, you know, and, and Dan was nice enough to ask to have us come out today. Uh, I'm going to keep this part uh, relatively short uh, if I can. I'm a bit long-winded, so I'll warn you right now. Uh, but uh, there was a lot of questions after yesterday's panel, and uh, so I want to make sure that we have appropriate amount of time for Q&A at the end. And I know there's tons of questions around virtual reality, how do we broadcast, how do we stream it, uh, all of those things. So we're going to touch on some of those, but I think that'll probably raise even more questions uh, for everyone. So uh, we'll, we'll get going. So. Um, 
you know, one of the things that's really important to talk about in virtual reality is kind of a historical perspective on where we are in the market today. You know, I think that, uh, you know, we, we really, you know, there's a lot of people walking around saying that they're experts in virtual reality. And if anybody tells you they're an expert in virtual reality, run the other direction because that just isn't true and it's not possible because we're really at the absolute beginnings of the virtual reality market in the first place. Um, and one of the things that we can kind of go back and look at is, is historically, what have we always done in the media markets, right? So, you know, one of the things to kind of keep in mind is that the very first demonstration of television was 1907. It wasn't until 1938 that we actually had a commercially viable product for TV, right? So that was 30 years of R&D and testing and demos and everything else that went along with that. And I'm not saying that virtual reality is going to take 30 years, but it's not going to take four, right? And so we're at a really early stage. And then the very first thing that we did uh, when we actually had a commercially viable product is we took the entertainment that we knew, and we pointed a TV camera at it, and that was our first television programming. And honestly, that's where we are right now today in the virtual reality market. We're taking everything that we know on TV, we're trying to capture it with a v virtual reality camera. Sometimes we're not even doing that all that well, to be honest, as a market. And, and so we're, we're really at the very beginning. Where virtual reality ends up, where that goes down the market is something that we're going to develop. If you start thinking about, you know, just even the, if you go back and look at television programs from 20, 30, 40 years ago, you look at television programs now, the story arc, the way that those programs are put together, the entertainment package that we're putting you know, out to the public now is so much different than what it was. And that's virtual reality. We're testing, we're playing, we're seeing what audiences are, are actually engaging with, what they actually um, even want to be looking at, what, they, what keeps them around, what's going to get them to actually pay for content uh, you know, in, in one way or the other. Because you know, this is a commercial product, right? So it's either got to be paid for through advertising, it's got to be paid for through subscription, or it's got to be paid for by individual download and, you know, on the products themselves. Uh, and so, you know, the other thing to really keep in mind um, and to understand virtual reality and, and you know, one of, the, one of the things that we talk a lot about, do a lot of education with our customers about, is, is how virtual reality is different from TV. It's not just TV and a headset. It's not just video and a headset. Uh, it is, you know, television itself is an arm's length distance. So that arm's length distance away is a third person passive experience, regardless of whether or not it's a computer or it's a phone or it's a television screen or whatever kind of screen it happens to be, your arm's length distance away from that content. And virtual reality is completely different from that. It's a first person experience. And that is the key difference between what Vir what differentiates virtual reality from traditional video content. There's also a lot of psychology that goes along with, with going to the first person. So as we start to think about content, um, you were talking a little bit yesterday about news, you know, and virtual reality from a news standpoint. You know, and think about from a first person standpoint, if you are no longer watching the news at arm's length distance, you are first person with a war correspondent on the ground able to look around. And, and the conversation from a content standpoint, you know, traditionally it is a war correspondent or news correspondent talking to the anchors. They're, it's, they're also, you're even removed another layer in traditional news. And in, in this world, you could have 20 million people watching that, that uh, experience or that, that newscast in virtual reality but it's still a one-to-one -one conversation. So it changes the psychology in the way that you actually have that. It also changes, in, in I think, in the news case, um, it, it has a real powerful ability to be able to change our perception around what's actually happening. Um, you take that over to the feature film world, you take that over to the television world, and you stop being a passive audience, and you start becoming an actual uh, character in the show. You can, you know, be inside of an action adventure movie, and you can be you can be a character in the movie. They can turn around and talk to you. You can be running through scenes. You can be going with them. So it changes the way that we actually write for for virtual reality. It changes the way that we perceive that content, and it actually, it, and it changes our our perception. I think of the world. It, it you know, it, it absolutely can do that. It has that ability. Uh, you know, we've seen some really great experiences in refugee camps and, you know, things like that. But, um, you know, it, it has, it, uh, you know, where, where that ends up, I think, is going to be, 
is going to be up to us largely as the content creators of all of this. But it does have a huge ability for us to be able to kind of think about this in a different way. Um, and we'll get into kind of the hardware side of things. So right now you've got basically four major players in the market. Um, you've got the Oculus Rift, which everybody's heard of, um, obviously bought by Facebook for a lot of money uh, a couple of years ago. But uh, you know they, they really helped drive this industry forward and, and put a lot of it. And Mark Zuckerberg, I think, had a lot of foresight into you know pushing this, developing 360 platforms. Um, he, a few months ago, called it the stickiest, most important piece of social media he'd ever seen. You know, and for a guy that has some pretty uh, good chops in that market, um, I think that's a, that's saying a lot, you know, and they're putting an enor enormous amount of money towards that. You've also got the HTC uh, the, uh, Vive uh, that was uh, co-developed with the guys over at Valve and Steam. Uh, that is probably our highest quality headset right now, uh, although it is incredibly bulky and uh, has a lot of cords. Uh, if there's anybody here from there, sorry. Uh, just a personal opinion. Uh, and actually, the only one that doesn't have cables is actually the Gear, the Samsung Gear VR. Um, and that one, I think, is, is honestly going to be everybody's first headset. It probably should be everybody's first headset. It takes a cell phone. Uh, you know, it's relatively easy, and it's wireless. So you can carry it around. I carry mine around with me. Um, although uh, sometimes I'm carrying an entire box of them around with us, but uh, that's, that's how that goes. Um, and then there's the Sony PlayStation Morpheus, uh, which is the first fully integrated to a console uh, VR headset. Sony is also uh, making a pitch that they're going to come out with all of their games uh, being full virtual reality. Gaming is obviously going to be an enormous part of the VR space. It's probably not something that we're going to be dealing with, you know, kind of in our industry too much because it's it's a it's a direct connected uh, experience, except for maybe in the esports uh, world where we're, we're looking at people watching other people play video games. You know, that that world I do think has a pretty rapid curve when you start looking at the, you know, everybody in here that's over 30 years old, like myself has a really hard time wrapping their brain around people watching other people play video games. Uh, it's about the worst thing I can think of, but uh, 80 million other people think that it's great. So uh, we're going we're gonna to go with it. Uh, you know, and it's certainly something that all of us need to take a look at, and there's a, certainly an enormous amount of streaming that's happening in that space with the guys at Twitch and Yahoo and, you know, all the other, you know, kind of players in that market, uh, you know, it is something that we have to take a look at. So, you know, the ability for, when we're, when we're talking to that audience, the ability for those guys to be able to sit inside a video game and watch their favorite players play the game from quite literally the board level. Uh, you know, we've been doing some testing in actual 3D rooms where they can walk around the actual game board. They can actually, you know, duck down. They can, they can stand on top of a chair and look over. They can do all kinds of crazy things, uh, and they love it. They just they go absolutely crazy for it. But that's kind of the headset game. Uh, and then we get into um, kind of how that works, how the headsets work a little bit. So you've all heard that virtual reality has the ability to make you sick and you know, you've all kind of like, oh, I did it one time and it was terrible. Um, I will also tell you that four years ago when they first, you know, said, hey, you know, here's, here's the next revolution. I mean, let's, let's go back a little bit. 20 years ago, we had virtual reality headsets. Let's, I want to make sure that everybody knows that. There were some things that were called the Power Glove. Nintendo had one. Um, they were very low resolution. These headsets are still very low resolution. Uh, comparatively, and there was a lot of problems in virtual reality. Uh, there was no really way to shoot it. We didn't have digital cameras. We had a lot of issues of being able to sync all those cameras together, so it just never really took off. And it was crazy expensive, and there was very little content. <clears throat> Fast forward another 20 years, and we've got headsets again. They're still bulky. They're still low resolution. We're still trying to figure out how to do content. Uh, but we have fixed a couple of problems. So the, what we're looking at in the headset world um, one of the things that made people sick originally is that these axes, this XYZ axis, uh, didn't all work together very well. So even four years ago, that's what was happening. So if you put your head back and turned it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't actually do that, right? Those are the, it was the, that pitch then, and the pitch and the yaw 
didn't work in combination. And so that gave you kind of this vertigo kind of feeling and it made everybody feel really sick. Uh, and that has since been fixed. So if you've heard that VR can make you sick, there are still a few people and we've got some experiences uh, as well where we've put, uh, we've put camera rigs on drones and flown them you know, at high speed and uh, that does get, people usually do have to hold onto a chair or sit down on that one. Uh, but that, was, that one's really personally fun for me to watch people do because <laughs> they tend to fall over. Uh, so, uh, but that's kind of how, how the science behind the headsets actually is working. Um, right now, you know, the highest resolution screen that you're getting on any of these devices, including you know, the Samsungs with your phone, is really about 2,000 pixels wide. And so uh, to talk about, uh, we'll, and we'll talk about that field of view and the resolution issues that go into that as well, but um, right now we're in, a, we're in an interesting spot. I'm calling it the camera disaster right now because uh, in my opinion, where we are on the actual capture side is even further behind where we are in the headset game. Um, we started out with GoPros, um, which was great for testing. Um, it was easy, they were cheap, we could buy 12, 16, 24, 48 of them and we could put them together in all kinds of different crazy arrays and, and start capturing every different angle that we could think of. And then uh, I think everyone decided that somehow that was what we should do and everyone decided to go out and build cameras that basically were ripped apart GoPros and shoved them into uh, single devices. And from an actual broadcast standpoint, from a commercially viable standpoint, from a cinema standpoint, that is absolutely the wrong direction to go. Um, a couple of reasons why that, and this is obviously, this is my opinion, there are plenty of people who think that some of these devices are okay. I think that these are ultimately, all of these are gonna become consumer devices. Um, and that's actually a great thing. This works really well for that because these are plug and play. And I do think that what everybody was trying to do in this space, in the camera space, was try to make virtual reality capture easy because by nature it is pretty, it's involved. It's not hard, it's not too hard for anybody in this room to go figure out how to do. It's just heavy, heavy involved, it takes a lot of processor power, it takes a lot of software, it takes a lot of expertise to get it right. Uh, and so everyone really went down this path of trying to have one cable, plug it in, have it go. Um, you know, I do think there are some spaces in this, but here's our innate problems for what we all do. If we're trying to capture a sporting event, for example, we've got LED screens everywhere. None of these cameras you can sync the shutters. None of these cameras you can change your exposure. None of these cameras can you actually change your, uh, you know, shutter speeds, your syncs, your any of that kind of stuff that you absolutely have to be able to do. You can't independently control any lens. Um, so if you're in, you know, an event where you've got a really bright field and a really dark, um, you know, or a stage or a concert, you know, you've got a, a bright stage, you've got a dark, you know, concert audience behind you, you're stuck, right? So that's gonna be black if you choose to expose or it's gonna expose for the, the low audience and blow out your stage. And there you have no control over that. And so that's an interesting, you know, I do think that some of that will get fixed from a software level. Um, it just hasn't gotten fixed yet. Um, and so that's that side. Um, that has led a lot of us in kind of the professional virtual reality market to start building our own rigs out of professional cameras. We build ours out of the Blackmagic Micro 4K cameras, the little tiny guys. Um, and those actually work really, really well. Um, I don't mind telling you that because we broadcast it and we show it on TV and, and NAB and all kinds of stuff. So. Um, you know, those, those guys are, are good right now. I think that this market is going to mature really fast. It's going to change as, you know, we're using the Blackmagic cameras right now because they're the best available on the market. As soon as there's something else that's better available on the market, we'll switch to using those. Um, when somebody finally gets an all-in-one unit right, as far as we're concerned, we'll use that. We don't really care what the cost is, it's just kind of where we're at in the market today. But, you know, this is, this is important to know that these guys are doing what we're doing and what everybody else is doing is they're testing. They're doing, this is their V1 first rev of all of these cameras. All this stuff is gonna get better over time. It's just the nature of the market. Um, and then we have to get into and talk about audio. Uh, these are hilarious, except that these are actually real microphones. 
Um, and so, you know, audio for us is, is um, something that we're actually going back and using century old technology and using binaural and, and ambisonic 3D audio. And the way that this works is that you, instead of capturing uh, a traditional right left stereo um, or, or a 5 1 mix or even an 11 1 mix, uh, you absolutely have to create and capture full 3D 360 audio. Uh, if you don't do that, you're in trouble because you're actually losing an, an entire sense in virtual reality. Being in that first person, you're already losing the sense, your sense of touch and your sense of smell. You need, you've got your sense of, of you know, full 360 sight, but audio is a big piece of this because you know, a lot of it also has to do with being able to direct the user's attention. And you can either direct the user's attention by, by putting on-screen um, you know, cues for them to look one way or the other, or you can do it with audio. You know, somebody can hear a car coming and they're going to look that direction. Uh, in cinema, we're using audio for misdirection. So somebody says, hey, out of one ear, they turn around and look, and then they turn back and we scare the heck out of them in the other direction, which is a lot of fun. Um, but it does require us actually having uh, and capturing 360 audio and mixing a full 360 uh, you know, audio mix that goes along with that and is actually synced and matched to um, our sphere on the, on the video side. Uh, and then we'll talk about captures. So on the capture side, you know, what we're doing is we're using four to six to eight to 16 camera rigs. Uh, what comes off of those rigs is uh, we're using uh, spherical lenses, r roughly about four millimeter, between three millimeter and four millimeter lenses, uh, depending on the kind of setups that we're using. Uh, and some of those are camera, those are actually lenses that we've rehoused. Some of those are uh, lenses that we've actually pulled the backs off of and added additional elements to be able to lens them correctly for the sensors and a bunch of other R&D craziness stuff that we've had to do. But what it gives us is it gives us basically these four um, you know, spherical quadrants. And then we take those through stitching software. There's a ton of stitching software out there. Uh, Video Stitch makes a good one for live. Um, you know, we've got guys at Nuke. We've got Adobe coming out with theirs. There's that, that market also is brand new. Those guys are testing as well. Um, none of it is perfect. It all takes a ton of processor power, uh, but it's just kind of, it's, it's where we are. We're at the infancy of this market. And so we take those, we use stitching software, we stitch them all together, and we get a panorama that looks basically like this. Uh, so this is one that we did for NASCAR a couple of months ago, or a couple of months ago, I guess. Um, and, and so you get this big 4K panorama, uh, that's really oddly warped. And what we do is we take that and we end up, so we've got our panorama up here at the top. I've got a laser pointer here. We've got this guy up here. So that's our panorama. And then what we do is we take that and we warp it around a 3D space, like in this guy right over here. And that then gives us that full 360 spherical view. Um, the thing that is important to know about that is then we start to get into understanding the field of view inside that space, and we get into a resolution issue. So if you've ever looked at virtual reality right now, and I will tell you that four years ago when they put the very first prototype Oculus on me and said, check it out, it's so cool, I had spent about 10 seconds inside it and said, it's blurry, you can have this back, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Because uh, I'm a resolution junkie, I've been in the 4K world since day one, I was you know, worked and consulted to the guys at Reg since the very beginning. Um, that world for me was all about resolution, and they just put the lowest resolution, poorest image I'd ever seen on my face, uh, and I hated it. <laughs> so um, it still drives me crazy. But I've also put that on other people as we've made that better. Um, you know, those first versions were only playing HD files. So one thing that's really important to understand why we're having this resolution issue and why resolution in 4K, and we'll talk about in a second, is so important, is that even at 4K, so we take that 4K panorama image, the one that you saw before, we warp that into first a circle and then spherical, and now you're looking at between a 90 and 120 degree field of view inside that 3D spherical space. And with that, at a 90, even at 4K, so let's talk about the for this 4K file. This 4K file only gives you 1024 pixels that you're seeing at a 90 degree field of view at any one time. That's both eyes, which means that each eye is somewhere around 500, right? So now, 
let's talk about perceptive resolution. So we take that file at 500 pixels an eye, or 1,000 collective. We put it an inch and a half from your face, and we have you look at it through two magnifying glasses. That doesn't, that's not that great from a resolution standpoint. And so it, that's a 4K file that's already low res. For us to get virtual reality to a spot where we see it as clear as we see our computer screens, our TVs at home, our phones, all that other stuff, we actually have to be at 16K. 16K is where we actually get a full 4K field of view at 90 degrees. So we have a long way to go in this market. And at that, we get into a whole new realm of stuff. So <clears throat> for all of you that thought you were going to stream virtual reality in HD, haha, -ha, no, you're not. Um, so they're just, even, and even if they download it, right? So let's talk about the download side. A 4K file, a five-minute experience in 4K at the lowest resolution that you can get a headset to play, you're talking about a 1.5 gig file. Now, in the early days of mobile, when that stuff first came out, we were playing a lot of that. We have a, an actual application development company, a digital company that does a ton of app development work. And we used to create these files for publishers. And we worked with Hearst, we worked with Condi, we worked with all the different big publishers to do their magazines on mobile. Uh, and we were doing 200 and 300 megabyte magazine files for people to download to their devices. And they would download about five of them, and then they would stop because they were too big. And we're assuming right now in the virtual reality space that people are going to download these experiences, not at one and a half gigs a piece. Most people are walking around with a 12, 32, maybe 64 gig phone. You take, take those at, that's the lowest site. You've got people that are trying to do these at traditional Blu-ray uh, sizes, and that's a 20 gig file for five minutes of H.264 or H.265. Now, we actually get into you know, talking about the streaming side. So streaming at 4K for virtual reality is really the baseline. That's where we have to start. That's why this is so important to this group and what you guys are all doing is that this is where we have to get to. And right now, there are no 4K streaming facilities on the planet. We're actually building one right now. Uh, but there's, you know, this is something that our industry, the bandwidth, everything that we have to get into, uh, there's a lot of talk about HAVC, there's a lot of talk about AVC, there's a lot of talk about how do we actually get higher compression. And those are all things that we got to work on. Because the reality is, is that, you know, HAVC is not going to get us down to where we need to be. You know, ultimately we need that 4K file to be somewhere in the 7 megabyte range to be able to stream to customers on LTE networks over home internet with enough headroom to be able to actually get a decent file. But if we over compress those files, too bad. We're, we're going to have just as bad a looking files as we were trying to stream them in H, just an HD file. You know, so there's a lot of work that we have to do on this space. This space is in its infancy as well. And this is something that I really think that most, a lot of people are not we're thinking about the content creation, we're thinking about the cameras, we're thinking about how to, the headsets and all that, but we're not thinking about how we actually go and deliver all of this content. And we're going to have to start thinking about that really quickly because this is coming. So this is what, this is kind of the, the conservative forecast right now for VR headsets. By the end of 2016, it's between 7 and 14 million. That's in the United States. What's that? Oh, head mounted display. Sorry. Um, and so that's, that's, a huge, that's a huge market um, that we're going to have just even right now. It's actually small compared to where we're going to be. So right now, these guys are, this, and this is, these are not my numbers, and this number has hovered somewhere between 150 billion, and now it's been readjusted to 120 billion. Um, I think this will get readjusted even more as we start to go and we start to understand what people are really doing. Uh, the biggest problems we're having in virtual reality right now is that Oculus and HTC can't keep up with their demand, um, which is one of the reasons why I also think that the, the phone you know, mounted displays are 
uh, going to become more and more and more uh, important because I do think that that's the gateway drug into virtual reality. I think that those are the, those are the entry points that everybody's going to do. The other thing that's total wild card right now is that Apple is doing something in virtual reality. They have been working on it for about four years. They're spending more money on that product than any other consumer product they've ever done. We have no idea what it is. So as we all know, when those guys move, everybody moves with them. Uh, hopefully it's good because they've taken a long time and they've spent a lot of money. So um, we'll see what that does to the market. But none of, none of these numbers right now take any of that into account. Uh, if they come out with something that is attached to the iPhone, that's a pretty large install base. Um, you know, you're talking, you know, I think Ericsson put out a, a report that said there's 9 billion mobile connected users right now. If you can take all of those users and you light them up on 360 and virtual reality and you give them the ability and the way to actually stream this, you've got a, you've got a huge install base. Uh, you know, and so one of the things that, that is a debate um, that I stay firmly out of, but I'm just going to show you the numbers, is that everyone's right now putting augmented reality above virtual reality from a numbers standpoint. Um, that number on the left is very speculative, considering that so far all we've seen is some tests on HoloLens and uh, some augmented reality sort of in the mobile space. And we were looking at whatever is going to come through on you know, a new version of Google Class or whatever that comes to. So I do think that there's an enormous amount of opportunity in this space. I do think that, that augmented reality will become part of mobile. And I think that's one of the reasons this number is so big. Uh, but I do think that it's also something that we're going to have to look at how it actually works. There is some social stuff around it, uh, you know, so we'll have to, we'll have to see how that, that works out. Um, and then virtual reality by revenues on products, you know, right now I think that in the VR space, looking at about $50 billion, um, in top line revenue, that's fairly equally split between hardware and software um, and how that actually is, is you know, going to be made up and how much the rest of it actually comes around. Um, in the content side. You know, these are early numbers, so we'll, we'll see how that moves. But uh, Nuzu, these guys actually put out a pretty interesting uh, poll just a couple of days ago, actually. And they polled a pretty decent amount of people um, that, that age, age 10 to 65. So they did a wide swath, um, which I think gives us a pretty interesting look at how many people really are interested or, you know, and gives us a, a, a good baseline. But this number down here for the United States is that t just 12%, or not just 12, but 12% of the Americans, this is in the next six months, intend to buy a virtual reality headset of some kind. That's 38 million people based on our current population in the United States. That's in the next six months, in the next year. Do I think that's going to happen? Not really, because I think that the market actually probably will only be able to support probably between 7 and 14. But that's the intent, right? So that just kind of shows us where that market can go. And as it matures, these numbers are all going to grow. Um, comparing these numbers to the early mobile numbers, they're pretty similar. And so I think there's a lot that actually can go in to looking at how, how these numbers relate back to other technology in this space. Um, so I think that's just an interesting, interesting piece. And then let's talk about just some economics for, you know, for those of us that are from networks or, or looking at this and how do we monetize some of this stuff. So if we took the, the lowest baseline at 7 million users, if you guys were able to convert 5%, just 5% of those users to look at your content. Right now, most content on the Oculus Store is hovering between 7 and $9 per per experience, which I think is way too high. I think that that's going to that's gonna stabilize out over the next year around $5, and I think it's going to drop down to eventually $1.99. But let's take these numbers for right now. If you took that at 5%, it's 350,000 users at $5 is 1.7 million per experience. So there's actually some monetization behind that from, from that side. Also, for the folks that are ad-supported, those are great numbers for you to go tell and talk to your advertisers about. Uh, because you can, you can start pulling in major ad dollars right now on virtual reality. We're doing it with customers, and it's working, and people are watching. 
And so there's, you know, not to mention all the, the actual PR that goes along with it of being first mover advantage and actually doing something that's actually interesting. There's a lot of media outlets. You put virtual reality into a press release and it gets picked up instantly. We've done it just for fun to see what happens. Um, it really does work. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, that's part, of, part of that game. Um, and so that's, that's the overview. That's kind of where, that's the market that we're in. Um, Hopefully there's a lot of questions, and uh, are we doing on time? Um, we're pretty good. So anyway, right up front. Yeah. Uh, what is the bandwidth issue? Uh, there's a lot of bandwidth issues. <laughs> uh, repeat the question. <laughs> uh, the question was, what are the bandwidth uh, issues? Uh, there's, it, it, we're all bandwidth issues right now. Uh, and so you can stream HD. Uh, to a headset. Uh, the problem is that that file looks terrible. So if you're streaming an HD file to a, a VR headset, that file is roughly between three and 500 pixels that it, on, the, on the high side um, that you're seeing per eye, sometimes as low as 200. And so you're showing an extraordinarily low quality VR file in HD. Uh, the problem is that's where we're all standardized right now as a streaming industry. And so 4K really does become your, your minimal product. Well, in, in 4K is you know, loaded with streaming issues and bandwidth. So I think that that's something that um, is going to have to get addressed. It's going to push the market. It's going to push all of us and what we're doing. And I think one of the reasons why it's so important to have these conversations and start looking at how, how collectively we all can actually start working in this market. So um, there's a ton of them. Next question. Hang on, I'm bringing the mic. This is kind of a two-part question. First, are we shooting this in 3D? And if we are shooting this in 3D, are we shooting one left eye and right eye separately? And wouldn't that solve splitting the resolution up by each eye since we, could, we don't have to split it up to have 500 pixels? Wouldn't that solve that problem? Um, it, it does from a capture standpoint if the devices could play it back like that. Um, and yes, we are shooting a lot of stuff in 3D. Um, ultimately, those files, once they're stitched, still become a 4K file because that's what the devices can play. None of the devices can play higher than that right now anyway. Um, and so, you know, the, the field of view, as that gets better, as we're started, we're able to actually feed, you know, higher resolution. You know, the, the part of the problem is that, um, you know, I don't have my phone in my back pocket like I normally do, but, you know, that screen on your phone is 2000, you know, 2097. Right? And so at the very best, if you split that screen in half, you're getting 1,000 pixels an eye. That's the best that you can do. Now, can you, you know, as those screens get better, we're going to start getting you know, better and better resolutions. We also, you know, the, the thing to think about from a, from a streaming standpoint, too, is that you know, 4K is where we're starting. You know, we have to get to 16K. You're never going to download that. You have to stream it. We have to start building codecs delivery networks, all the things that go along with that, that that will help us be able to start doing that. That's also, you know, that's just in VR. You've got all the smart TVs, connected TVs. I don't think they're going to stop at 4K. Um, it's going to be pretty interesting to kind of see how that market goes. But um, that's, a, that's a great question. Next question up here. Uh, what do you think about Facebook's uh, cube encoding method? And also, what do you think about Nokia Ozo? <laughs> Are you from Ozo? <laughs> so, uh, um, it was a great first try. Um, I think that uh, I think that uh, like all the other cameras, it's going to have to go through some iterations before it becomes commercially viable. Um, I've seen a lot of people try to use the Ozo. I've seen a lot of people be very frustrated. I've seen some good stuff out of it. Um, I think that I think that. Nokia is taking a really big swing and a change in direction in the company, which I think is admirable. And I think it's a, a really, you know, they've taken a smart approach to what they're doing. Um, we just have to get to that next level. You know, it's every, it's a lot of money to spend on R&D. And um, I hope that the companies like the Nokias and everybody else who's doing this have the runway to, to be able to go to that next V2s and get them right. Um, I suspect there's going to be a lot of consolidation in those markets. Um, you know, the, the cube encoding and, you know, some of what Google Cloud is doing on the encoding, stitching side um, is fantastic for that, that consumer user. 
Um, the problem of, for a professional user is that you have no control over it and you don't have the ability to schedule when you get it back. Um, and so those things are, you're kind of up to their, their scheduling. Um, so for on-demand, good. I was actually referring to the delivery method. Oh, got it. Yeah. Um, so referring to the delivery method. Just yeah, yeah. Just capture this on audio. Yep, sorry. So the delivery method, it's actually pretty good. Um, we've been doing a lot of work with, with Facebook on, on some content for uh, strategic partners of theirs. Um, and, you know, it's, it's working pretty quick. Um, you know, I want to see, you know, both Facebook and YouTube get to full browser compatibility. Right now they're split, uh, you know, so I don't love that. You know, I think that it's, you know, we have, we have players that we built that can, that are cross browser compatible and we're not them. So I, I hope that, I hope that gets there soon. Uh, but I do think it's actually pretty good. I think they're onto something for sure. Next yeah. question here and then in the back. Yeah, I was just curious, do you know anything or have you, uh, are you familiar with Glyph? Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, Glyph is um, a virtual retina display. Instead oh. of having a screen, they yep. project the image into the retina. Yep. And I was just curious if you had had any experience with it or not. I've played with it a little bit, but I not enough to, to have an opinion. Yeah, I mean, I've, uh, I wear contacts, so I get flaring. And so I, I'm also, being a color and resolution junkie, I get really weirded out by people projecting stuff onto my retinas. Um, it is pretty cool. It is cool. Um, I want to see a lot of science. Like, you know, I won't let them do LASIK on me yet. So uh, we'll see, we'll see how, we, how far we get on that, that one. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's interesting. I think that some of the stuff that HoloLens is doing now is, is really interesting. Some of the new stuff we've seen there is, is I think, a, a really interesting combination between virtual reality and augmented reality. And um, I think they're onto something. And so I hope it's a product that they continue with and continue to, to build because I do think that it has real world applications, um, specifically even in the, like the medical industries. I think there's some really interesting stuff happening in AR and VR in medical. Uh, you know, that's a whole other piece and also in military. You know, I think that both of those, both of those worlds in that market, I think are gonna do a lot of driving for us because uh, they're going to be heavy users and they're going to want certain things. You know, being able to fly a UAV from a first-person standpoint and never have to be in the plane is pretty cool. And, and it gives us some distinct advantages of, you know, rather than flying it from a computer screen with a joystick, uh, you know, you actually can, you know, that you can dogfight with a UAV at first person. That's, that's has advantages. <laughs> uh, but anyway. Question here in the back. So what's going to keep history from repeating itself? 20 years ago, there was a, a terrible user experience and the industry didn't develop. Now we're selling 7 million units into what is, you're telling us is going to be a substandard uh, experience. So why are people, why is the next generation <laughs> of people going to buy this if it's going to be terrible out of the gate? That is a fantastic question. Uh, well, he, nothing's going to keep history from repeating itself, um, is, the, is the blunt answer back to that. Um, I do think the video gaming market is going to be a huge driver, and, I, and probably the safety net to virtual reality early on. Um, you know, I tell you know, clients right now, and, and you know, realistically, if you're buying a headset today, and you take it home, and you unpack it, and you set it up, you will burn through just about all the content that's available in about two days. And then you're going to put it in a box and go, well, that was fun. Um, I hope I feel good about the $700 I just spent. Um, you know, and so you know, it, is, it is up to the content creators and guys like us uh, and, and up to the cu customers. And that's part of what, what we're doing on the, on the agency side and on the brand side and the network side and, is educating you know, those customers about what VR can actually do, what kind of sidecar experiences that we can create that go deeper. You know, can you get that first person you know, walking interview at the Olympics? Yeah, you can. It's a pretty cool thing. You know, and so there's, there's a lot of stuff in that that I think that will, you're gonna see a massive ramp up in the production side. 
Um, there's a lot of little production companies. It's actually really exciting to me to see standard production companies, folks that have been in the production industry for a really long time, starting to play in VR because I think that's good for all of us. You know, the high water rises all boats method is is really something that we we subscribe to. Uh, one of the problems that we see in virtual reality right now is that a lot of the VR companies that are out there, um, and if you're from one of those VR companies, I apologize right now. Uh, you know, you see these guys that have zero production experience that were developers six months ago, figured out how to do some stitching, they bought some GoPros, and now they have a VR company, and then they go set foot on you know, a big network set, and they get themselves thrown right off as fast as possible because they have zero production experience. They've never been on set before. They don't know how it works. They don't know the union rules. They're stepping all over the crew. The, you know, the directors are like, who are these guys? And they want their rig eight feet away from the, from the subject. That is in every shot I have. No is the answer. You know? And so they just get tossed. Uh, you know, so it's, really, it's exciting to me to see real large scale production companies getting into this market because that will solve a lot of those problems. And I think that those companies are used to making real stories. You know, they're used to making editorial content that keeps people around. You know, right now the big thing in virtual reality is this fly on the wall thing where, oh, I get to be there and stand in this one spot and look around. That's, you know, it's boring to us. We try not to sell that. We have people that call us and say, that's what I want. I will pay you to do it. I don't care that you don't like it. Just do it. And we go, OK, fine. Uh, but the reality is, is that when you take those experiences and you put it on somebody, they will watch it. It could be a two minute long experience. They'll watch it for about 45 seconds to a minute, take it off, hand it back to you, and say, that was cool. And then not really be that interested to go on to four or five more. We have to. It's kind of like if you just took a single camera and you pointed it at a sporting event or whatever thing that you're covering with just one camera, never cut, never had any editorial, never had any commentary, and never had a graphics package. That's honestly what we're doing right now in virtual reality. Uh, it's not all that interesting. So as the professional guys get in, as we get companies like VizRT and, and you know, all the other you know, graphic switching companies, there's a bunch of other, you know, we were on a panel with, with some guys yesterday that are working on you know, um, AR overlays for virtual reality. That's awesome. That's a fantastic piece because it starts to actually go into editorializing and actually entertaining people. You know, virtual reality is only as good as the entertainment value that it provides. Because uh, it is a new format, it is a new medium, but we still, we have a very highly educated customer that we're pushing this to. And if we don't entertain them, they won't stick around. And so I think that it's our job as the content creators to make sure that we're creating good content or history will repeat itself. Absolutely. All right, another question in the back here. All right, uh, I'm very interested in the VR world. I'm, I've worked for a, a multinational media company. We, are, we play in the B2B space. We just sold a five package deal to uh, one of our big clients. Uh, they're going to do the fly, the fly on the wall, which again, I, I tried to pitch against it, you yeah. know, and I said, well, <laughs> let's do the Ray Tracy and let's do the, and like, yeah. whoa, 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 whoa. We, we don't want $15,000 per finished minute, you know, at that rate when you're doing ray tracing. So I said, right. okay, fine, fine. We'll, we'll dumb it down. And we, and I, I, I mean, I'm embarrassed to say this. We went to Best Buy and got the 360 fly. And we are going to do the whole project on 360 Fly. <laughs> and we did a proof of concept, and everyone loves it. Like, they're going, they're jumping, they're doing jumping jacks. And yep. they, we just inked, uh, you know, again, five projects with this one client. So I, I think there's, there's potential here. And, and that's just a little background on me. But I have a question. I don't know if you went to NAB. Did you go to the Lytro introduction? Yes. Yep. I spent like, a lot, I've been working and spending a lot of time with those guys. I, so I guess, yeah. how are they solving their stream? You know, they're like, well, yeah, we've got, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do everything to the web. We'll do everything to the cloud. So they're shooting, you know, 300 frames per second at however <laughs> megs per second to the cloud. Yeah. There's some streaming that, you know, again, how, how is that, which I think could help solve, our, you know, the VR problem too. I think mm -hmm. those two, whether it's a light field camera or trying to get enough for 16K, th there's some crossover in there somewhere. And how is that going to be solved? Or yep. do you know anything about that? Yeah, so uh, two parts. What you're seeing, I think, of being able to go with those consumer products is that we're still in the wow factor for VR. And, and any VR to a lot of customers is better than no VR. And so the ability to just kind of put it on and look around, everybody goes, wow, that's cool, 
right? We're going to move past that really fast. You know, those customers of ours that, you know, we're doing stuff that's 10 levels past that already, after they've seen version one, two or three times, they're sick of it already. Now they start to, you know, at the beginning, it doesn't have to be color corrected. There can be stitch points. There's all these things that are fine at the first time. Two or three projects down the road, there's stitch points. I, how come there's, you know, a bigger circle at the bottom, at the top? Um, how come it's not fully color corrected? You know, I want to be able to, you know, I want the full 3D sound. I want all this stuff. So, you know, from a client standpoint, um, you get away with a lot at the beginning, and and we certainly have also. So I'll be totally honest on that. Uh, when it comes to Lightfield, Lightfield is, um, I think, one of the most exciting technologies uh, that's coming out in in, and I will say, the next 10 years. Um, and so. Uh, there's a lot of theory behind how they're going to move that data right now. Um, right now, they're moving it from a camera to a very fast solid state server that it's connected to. Uh, moving that data over the air in any uh, kind of speed is, is going to take a lot. Um, we're in, in one of our other companies, uh, we're actually building a, a heavy duty next generation video delivery. Uh, both acceptance uh, system and delivery system. Um, so working, you know, with things like spot beam, working with, you know, high band fiber to be able to actually, you know, ingest all of that content is something that we all have to do. You know, there there's going to have to be that, that intermediary, uh, you know, uh, client that actually helps deal with all this data as we get into things like Lytro. Um, you know, the thing about Lytro, you know, in their camera, we're talking about a 755 megapixel camera, right? As that sensor, you know, this is, the, this is the first new sensor technology since CCDs, since the CMOS sensor in the 70s, right? So we've, we're creating a completely different way to capture, you know, capture images with light field, you know, as those chips work their way into black magic cameras and GoPros and, you know, these VR cameras and REDs and REs and, and all of that kind of stuff, you're going to start to see a massive shift in the way we actually capture, you know, the, the content, you know, from, from that standpoint. Uh, you know, what they're doing is, you know, is testing. They're playing too. It's a phenomenal technology. I don't know if you got a chance to look at the Lytro camera, um, but it's the size of a small car right now. Lytro, <laughs> Lytro, L Y T R O, T R O, and it's, uh, it's that's the company. Uh, the the technology is called Light Field Capture, um, and that's basically the sensor technology. And what it what it does, just for everybody who is not familiar with it, uh, it captures not only reflective information, but it captures the distance. It captures the uh, infrared. It captures all of, kind of all of the information that a CCD can actually capture. Um, it's it's born out of military grade uh, uh, telescopes, and so the ability to see deep into space, we're able to measure distance by by light. And so that's literally what they're doing. One of the really cool features that they show off all the time is that after you shoot something in in Lytro or Light Field, you're able to say, oh. I didn't really want the focus right here up close. I really wanted it back over there. And you can move the focus point. You can also move up to 100 millimeters in lensing one way or the other, in, out, without anything. You can, you can literally on the fly say, oh, I want this to look like anamorphic. Anamorphic. You know, and it's, it's a really fascinating you know, tool. Um, just talking about the data for a second. So I was with those guys at NAB. Uh, we sat down and we actually figured out what it was going to what it was going to take from a data standpoint to shoot a full length feature film, just the raw capture to be able to shoot a film, and the rough estimates that we came up with just from a data standpoint was six petabytes of information for one film. So we have a long way to go on that to start to figure out how to actually stream that, move it, deal with it, you know, everything else. The idea of being able to do you know, uh, plugins for Premiere, um, and just be able to work on it off the cloud is is uh, it's a bit it's a bit it's a ways off. So, <laughs> uh, but it's fascinating technology. I'm super excited about it. Um, I think those guys are onto something. You know, just phenomenally you know exciting. So, 
Excellent. Well, uh, one quick announcement. Uh, the exhibit hall will be open. There's coffee there. Uh, check out the streaming devices pavilion. Uh, and check out, again, we have a lot of vendors with some VR technology as well, so go check that out. Uh, nice big round of applause again for Josh Courtney with SkyVR. Thank you.